All right. So, uh, right. This is, uh, I'm going to talk about some aspects of work that's been going on for uh, maybe seven years now uh, with a bunch of different people. So this slide is to give credit to those people and the funding agencies that help pay for it. Uh, so you'll see uh, different aspects of work that I've done joint with Dave Ambrose and Doug Wright at Drexel. Uh, so that's the first two gentlemen here. Uh, then uh, David Sulon was a graduate student of Dave, Dave Ambrose, uh, who then did a postdoc Dickinson and now is a research technician for a hospital in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, Kevin Pond was a major in the Air Force with me at AFIT, uh, who did some joint work on this. Uh, Matt Cedars uh, was my PhD student at AFIT, who is now at the Air Force Academy as a, as a military instructor there. Uh, Jonah Rieger uh, was also joint with me at AFIT uh, and since left for AFIT for the Naval Academy and now is back working at the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, in addition to all these people, uh, this project was funded at various points by the Simons Foundation, uh, AFOSR, that's the Air Force's uh, grant funding agency and ONR, the Navy's version. Oh my goodness, there we go. Uh, so what am I actually gonna talk about besides just giving credit to everybody? Uh, this talk is about computing equilibria to partial differential equations. Uh, you could think of them as computing equilibria to any an arbitrary dynamical system, really. Uh, and these equilibria that we're searching for are overturned traveling waves to some equation, whether it be a model equation or whether it be the Navier-Stokes equations, some partial differential equation. We want that support that whose solutions can be thought of as uh, a graph uh, in as the boundary between two-dimensional space, like in this picture here on my slide, or uh, as the interface between uh, two, two three-dimensional fluids. Uh, so we're going to be trying to compute those. Uh, the techniques we'll use are kind of classic root finding algorithms uh, applied to a projection of this differential equation into some basis set. Uh, those classic methods, like say Newton's methods, what we'll feature here, uh, require an initial guess. And a classic strategy for getting an initial guess to compute large or far from equal or far from trivial, far from linear solutions to a differential equation is to use continuation to large amplitude. Uh, and we'll talk about how you can use that uh, married with a dimension breaking strategy to compute large overturned traveling waves in three dimensional fluids or at the interface between three dimensional fluids. So uh, when I say equilibria here, I really do mean the same type of thing you would talk about in the first class in ordinary differential equations. Uh, you have some dynamical system. So I have a cartoon of a dynamical system here and it has some fixed points. And what do the fixed points satisfy? Uh, they're the roots of the right hand side. Right? You just turn the time derivative off. I set it to zero and get some maybe algebraic equation if this is a finite dimensional problem and you find the roots of that algebraic equation. And so this is kind of a cartoon of a phase portrait which has some equilibria, some fixed points in it. Uh, and the same thing is true in if you leave the finite dimensional setting and go to the infinite dimensional setting where instead of having uh, a classic dynamical system, you now have a partial differential equation. So you have some time derivative equals some function of maybe a speed that the wave is traveling and some derivatives and then of the solution itself. And when I say I'm looking for traveling waves, those are really equilibria, stationary solutions of this differential equation if I just move to a frame that travels with the wave speed. So the things I'm calling traveling waves, you could think of them as fixed points. Uh, and so the fixed points might look a lot more complicated, right? In the left-hand picture, they're stars. There's some dot in a phase portrait. And the right-hand picture, this is a function of two dimensions uh, in a much higher dimensional space. But it's still, morally speaking, just a fixed point of a dynamical system. Uh, so the cartoons I showed you on the previous slide, those are equilibria, uh, just kind of cartoons. We're not going to be searching for an arbitrary equilibria. We're going to be searching in this talk for overturned traveling waves. So waves being things like at the interface between two fluids. And the aspect we're going to require of these is that they're not a function of the horizontal spatial, spatial coordinate. So if you look at uh, either of these two cartoons on the right, these are kind of the most classic uh, oldest computations of overturned traveling waves. Uh, the top right corner, there's this picture due to Crapper uh, in 18 or 1950-ish, uh, where he computed these exact traveling solutions, a whole branch of them. So the bottom bottom curve is near is near uh, the linear solution to water waves. Uh, and as in, as you increase the amplitude up the solution branch, uh, they become more nonlinear until you get some traveling solution that uh, not only overturns, but pinches off and entrains a bubble in the lower fluid. 
so we're, we're searching for the things like kind of up here high on the on the branch of solutions so when you compute an equilibria there's often not just one so in the in the traveling wave problem there are entire branches of these equilibria and we're going to try and move far along those branches uh, so if you start at the flat state being linear you want to move far enough along uh, along this get the solution nonlinear enough so that it overturns and that is somehow the interesting thing we're searching for uh, this top right picture has a lot of surface tension that's not really so important uh, the bottom left one has no surface tension and the fluids are near density matched uh, this one is the bottom right one is due to Mirren and Safman and the top one is due to Crapper and that this these things have been studied for uh, what this is almost a 80 year period here in my timeline uh, and lots of people have published uh, computations of overturned traveling waves and of their dynamics in various different reg physical regimes uh, the thing that all of these historical works have in common is that the waves that are computed are planar which means another way of saying it's a two-dimensional fluid with maybe a one-dimensional interface uh, and the reason that all the historical works uh, use that two or are, are in the two-dimensional setting is because they for the most part take advantage of conformal variables uh, to do some conformal mapping to make the after doing the transformation the functions you're trying to solve for uh, are functions of the conformally mapped variable so you get like a graph in conformal variables or a function in conformal variables instead of a curve right this curve is not a function of the horizontal coordinate but after conformal mapping it might be uh, so that's all well and good, except if you want to compute three-dimensional traveling waves, which overturn, a conformal mapping isn't available to you anymore. The, it, there isn't a nice generalization of conformal mappings to three-dimensional space, uh, which means you have to do something else. Uh, and what are you trying to do? Uh, well, you're trying to find a parameterized surface. So here's a cartoon of an overturned traveling wave. Uh, I think this is computed in some model, but it's not important for our purposes of this discussion. So it's got an interface which uh is not a function of x1 or x2 the two horizontal coordinates so instead i have to think of x1 x2 and x3 as unknowns uh which depend on some parameterizing variable alpha and beta and maybe they depend on time if i was trying to do the time evolution uh i'm going to try and find solutions which are steady uh here so traveling overturned tra overturned uh waves three-dimensional overturned waves and in order to do that i'll move to a stationary frame uh, that's a thing that's easy to say what it means. What does it mean to move to a stationary frame if the function you're searching for, u, uh, is a function of x, right? If, I'm, if the interface was a function of the horizontal coordinate, what it means to travel is to just search for a function of x minus ct. Um, that's not what you get to do if the, if the interface you're trying to solve for is not a function of x, a function of this alpha or beta. A uh, traveling wave in alpha and beta does not move as alpha minus ct. Instead, you have to appeal to some other some other onsets and so something like this works to say that like I want the interface's position as a function of time to move with velocity which is a constant velocity in one coordinate and zero in the other two coordinates uh, so that's to say it's not trivial to compute traveling waves in a, which overturn in an arbitrary model you need the model to allow for uh, a specification of velocity in, a, in an onsets like this uh, so those are two ingredients to begin and then the the last requirement we're going to impose on ourselves when computing these waves is that uh, we want the solution we were searching for is the overturned one it's going to be far from linear so if i like if i quantify how nonlinear the solution is by the maximal displacement of this curve from its maximum to its minimum from its crest to its trough i want that thing to not be small not be order epsilon but to be order one uh, which means that if I use the classic continuation approach, uh, which I'll discuss in the next slide or two, to compute them, I'm going to have to travel far along a bifurcation branch. I'm going to have to get far from the, the trivial zero solution to the PDE in order to find this order one solution, uh, which might have the properties I'm searching for. Uh, so how are we going to compute these traveling waves? I said the approach is uh, kind of classic. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, you take each of these uh, interface locations, x1, x2, and x3, and you project them into, if you're searching for periodic traveling waves, project them into Fourier space, you project them onto some basis set. So here I've used Fourier, but you could use uh, a basis set that's appropriate for the boundary conditions of your problem. Uh, and that transforms your infinite dimensional partial differential equation into some finite dimensional approximation. So now instead of solving for functions x1 x2 and x3 and, and maybe mu if there was so i in the previous slide i only showed you the interface location 
but in essentially every physical model where you'd want to do this, there would be both an interface location and a velocity field you'd have to solve for, uh, or maybe a potential. So this mu is effectively like a potential that you'd have to solve for. So I have to, in order to solve for the solution, that requires finding uh, the projection of this solution onto a whole bunch of Fourier coefficients, so a bunch of, of, of unknowns that are the Fourier, uh, Fourier coefficients of these, of these functions, uh, and then also the speed that this thing is traveling at. Uh, and how do you find those? Well, you have to have some set of equations. Uh, and the, the way that the, op, that the counting works, if you like kind of look in here, there's maybe n times n equations or n times n unknowns uh, in x1, and n times n unknowns in x2, and n times n unknowns in x3, and n times n unknowns in, in mu. So that's kind of like four m times n unknowns, if capital N and capital N are the number of uh, coefficients I'm keeping in each of these series. Uh, so I have to somehow have four function valued equations, or four, four times capital N times capital N uh, equations in order to specify all those unknowns. And the way that that ends up working in these problems is, uh, well, I'll appeal to physics somehow. That'll give me two equations. Uh, so if this were the classic water wave uh, equations, it would be something like, I want continuity of the interface, and I want Bernoulli's equation. I would say something like, the fluid is continuous. That would be a, a fluid a equation from physics. And I would have also, I would say something like, uh, momentum is conserved on the interface. So that would be the two partial differential equations you would see that like came from your physical problem. But then you've picked a parameterization in this, in this framework. Like I choose to parameterize the surface. There's not only one way to parameterize the surface, there are certainly lots. Uh, so by saying I want x1, x2, and x3 to be parameterized variables, then I get to pick some equations for the parameterization. Uh, and in order to have enough equations for my unknowns, I'm gonna have two function valued, if you will, two equations which have, two, have m times n Fourier coefficients to check later. Uh, that come from the parameterization I've picked. So uh, a classic thing you might do uh, is to say I want like uh, an isothermal parameterization or something like arc length, where I say how fast does alpha change along the curve and how fast does beta change along the curve, but then also like what's the relationship between alpha and beta? Like are they locally orthogonal coordinates? Something like that. Uh, and that information about your parameterization becomes a new set of equations that your unknowns have to satisfy. Uh, and then you get a couple other ones like, I mean, I need an equation that specifies this uh, coefficient and I need uh, some equations that say the periodicity of the problem. So uh, by specifying an amplitude, I can close for the speed. And by specifying the period of the solution I'm searching for, I can close for this L1 and L2, which effectively just come from the period. And after having done that, I'll have a system of equations where I have the right number of unknowns and equations. Well, by right number, I mean if I'm using my intuition from solving linear systems. And then once I have the morally right number of equations and unknowns, I can apply to some root finding algorithm to try and solve for uh, the, these unknowns and then turn them back into my, uh, into my traveling solution in my wave. And so what, what, might, what might one do to try and compute these unknowns? Well, you might, you're trying to find the roots of something that's algebraic effectively. Uh, you might appeal to Newton's method. So here's Newton's method for scalar valued function. It just says uh, approximate the, the curve you're trying to find the roots of as, as its linearization and then find the roots of that linearization iteratively. And Newton's method works really well. It's really fast if you can compute these derivatives, which you typically can't do. Uh, and so you sacrifice the actual com computation of these derivatives to do some secant-like method. Uh, that works still pretty fast. Uh, but it requires an initial guess, and it is fundamentally one-dimensional. Uh, so if you want to go to higher dimensions, you do something like Broyden's method. Uh, so Broyden's method just pretends like f is now vector-valued, and you compute some approximation of a Jacobian. And the secant method version of computing that Jacobian uh, uses uh, uses kind of a, a successive approximations of the Jacobian with the secant-like condition, and then a minimization of the of the norm of the difference of your successive Jacobians. So it's a kind of, there's a very classic uh, that you might use a method like this. It'll, 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 Broyden's methods allow you to not have to fill the Jacobian every time. So they're a little bit faster. The thing that all of these methods share is that they work well with a good initial guess. So if I was say trying to find this route, uh, maybe the, the guess on the right would work well. It starts to convert, it 
the iterations take me closer and closer to the root. But if I tried to use the guess on the left, I'm going to shoot off to infinity. And it's a classic uh, weakness of Newton's uh, quasi-Newton methods. So if you're going to if you're going to use these methods, what you need is some type of way to get a good initial guess. And uh, there are lots of ways for uh, depending on the problem you're looking at, you might say have access to an exact solution. So these crapper waves, these are exact solutions for one parameter value. Uh, so I could compute waves up to very large amplitude, maybe uh, using crapper's solution as initial guess, and it should work immediately. And then I could change my parameters and successively compute. If I if this works for say gravity equals zero, I could put small amounts of gravity into the problem if I'm interested in gravity waves and use Newton's method over and over again to step from one of these exact solutions to something that's not uh, in the range where I had an exact solution. Uh, if I'm solving a an equation where I don't have access to an exact solution like Crapper, well, I could do what Stokes did in the 1840s, where he just finds a perturbation approximation to the solution and says, well, for small amplitude, it looks like they look like sinusoids. And then he turned the crank a couple more orders, but my experience has been the first order approximation is enough to get Newton's method to converge. Uh, so you could start near the trivial, not start near the flat state, uh, get a guess for what the solution is you're looking for, and then use classic continuation to compute larger and larger waves. And if that's not the type you're looking for, there are lots of other asymptotics out there. So like you could use a nonlinear Schrodinger type approach if you're searching for wave packets, or, or Stokes approach if you're searching for periodic waves, or, uh, or maybe something more complicated exists in the problem you're interested in. So after you have a good initial guess, you apply Newton's method once, uh, you get one wave profile. And then to move from that one wave profile, what continuation says as an argument is to use that one wave profile as initial guess for the next wave profile, and then for the next wave profile, the next wave profile. So here in this slide, I have pictures of consecutive wave profiles at increasing amplitude. These are actually the crapper waves uh, whose old timey picture was on the previous slide. Uh, here I have the waves at successively larger amplitude up until the one that self intersects that, that were computed, and each of those corresponds to some point in a in a bifurcation space in some like this is the amplitude of the wave on the x-axis and the speed of the wave on the y-axis and you compute some bifurcation curve by finding one point on it one wave profile and using that as a guess for the next wave where you specify that the the next solution you're searching for must have slightly larger amplitude and you can do that successively so long as this curve is continuous um, and you don't try and take too large a step. So maybe you have to iteratively choose your step size to, to trace some bifurcation curve. But otherwise, that's how, how uh, continuation works in general. Uh, this method works great in two dimensions because two dimensions isn't that expensive. Uh, we're going to ultimately, for the purpose of this talk, be interested in computing waves at large amplitude uh, where the overturning happens and in three dimensions where it's a lot more expensive. So that brings us to dimension breaking numerical continuation. So what is dimension breaking as a, as, a, as a procedure? It's I pretend I have some possibly large amplitude solution right, that I've computed in 2D. So this is a two-dimensional, uh, one-dimensional curve, but think of it as the interface between two, uh, between two dimensional fluids. Uh, and I've computed a whole bifurcation branch of those. So like on the previous slide, this blue curve is meant to be the uh, branch of planar waves whose, uh, that I've computed at a large selection of amplitudes. And then what I want to try and do is at some point on that bifurcation branch, I want to step off of the branch of two dimensional things. So that this picture I have in the top left is a one dimensional curve that's meant to be the interface between two two dimensional fluids. But I can always, oops, I can always trivially, trivially extend such a curve uh, in the transverse direction to be a solution to the three dimensional problem that just doesn't depend on the other coordinate. Or at least I can do that in a large class of equations and all the ones I'm interested in here. Once I've done that, my hope is that nearby this planar solution, nearby this thing that doesn't depend on the transverse coordinate, there exists a three-dimensional solution with small transverse variation. Uh, and dimension breaking continuation as a procedure says, use the one-dimensional solution curve up to some large amplitude, and then try and step off it and compute three-dimensional things that bifurcate from some particular point. So they have start with small transverse variation, but then I maybe continue in how much transver transverse variation I make the solution have. So in, one might do such a thing by switching from specifying the maximum height of the solution that I'm searching for, as, as I might have done along this blue bifurcation curve, to trying to specify 
maybe the second derivative in y of this solution or in the transverse direction of the solution so that it started having zero derivative in the transverse direction and then had more and more negative second derivative uh, and use that as a continuation parameter to try and compute more and more three-dimensional solutions and the, the point of this procedure is that I can pay the two-dimensional cost. I can use compute two-dimensional solutions for most of my continuation procedure until I get to large amplitude and then step off. And the second I step off, I've computed a large overturned three-dimensional thing. And I just have to say, how much transverse variation do I want it to have? And that's where I paid the three-dimensional cost is adding the transverse variation instead of just stepping up the amplitude. Uh, so how should you do that? What, what, is the, what are the mathematics of, of, of trying to do that cartoon on the previous slide? Well, you might take your favorite equation. So here's kind of a classic uh, equation for traveling waves that uh, people in the nonlinear waves community would study, the KP or Kadomtsev petvishvili equation. So it's like KDV with uh, a couple of y derivatives. Uh, and say, well, this equation, KDV at least, has a solution I'm very familiar with the solitary wave solution of KDV. And so I have that solution for a whole branch for all values of C, the larger I make C here, the bigger the wave gets. Uh, and at some point along that branch, I'm gonna say, okay, let's look for a solution, which is that KDV solution. So U naught is gonna be this solitary wave solution KDV, uh, plus some small number, so delta is a small parameter, times some spatial X dependence times cosine for example. So this is saying, now I want it to have Y dependence with some period and some small amount of Y dependence. And I'm gonna substitute that in the equation and do what we typically do and linearize uh, and end up with uh, something that looks kind of like an, uh, an eigenvalue problem for the function U1 and the period K. So this is like actually the major challenge of doing this dimension breaking, my, at least in my experience, all the time the, the dependence of this dimension breaking bifurcations is like cosine is like a sinusoid so that's the thing you could have done without linearizing and solving an eigen problem uh, but what the period is of that cosine is unknown of the problem and there won't be dimension breaking bifurcations of general period only of special periods so it's kind of like you have to find the eigenvalues of this thing to find out what period uh, the transverse bifurcations occur at and if you've ever done any anything numerical the period is a thing you do you specify first in doing some numerical computation. You say, I'm going to discretize a spatial domain of some size. Right. So if I don't know the period, how do I pick the size? Right. I might I just keep guessing and guessing and guessing, and I'm not going to find solutions until I've gotten really, really close to the period I needed. Uh, and all the rest of the time I'm discretizing the wrong domain. Uh, so conceding that this is too hard to just guess the period. Then I have to solve something that looks like an eigenvalue problem, where I get A and B from the equation here, plugging in. Uh, for KDV, you can write this down, or for KP, you can write this down exactly. Uh, and it just has the linearization of KP. Uh, and the, the second derivative in Y induces a K squared uh, here in the, the thing that's like an eigenvalue problem. Uh, and for, KD, for KP, you can actually solve this problem exactly. Uh, and find out what the eigenfunctions are. And there's something like Setch and Setch cubed. So they look, roughly speaking, like the original wave profile. And there's a, there's a particular period. Uh, I think this is the solution only at, at the speed C equals one. But at all speeds, you can write down what the exact solution is of this, of this quasi-eigenvalue, generalized eigenvalue problem. Uh, so that's great. Uh, you shouldn't expect to be able to do that all the time. You shouldn't expect to always be able to solve the eigenvalue problem exactly. But you, should, but you might hope that you can write it as, an, as something like an eigenvalue problem, right? So here we have, in the previous cartoon, we had some linear operator A applied to U1, and then some function of B, or some function B of K applied to U2. And when we look at what it actually was, the linear operator had a bunch of derivatives and non-constant coefficients in it, uh, but the thing that applied to B was just, a, was just K squared. So I could think of minus K squared as an eigenvalue, and if I wanted to solve this problem, all I would have to do is like, plug in my approximation of A into MATLAB and type eig, and it would spit out all the eigenvalues and all the eigenfunctions. And then I'd be able to look at those eigenvalues and say, well, which one of these are negative and real so that I can solve for what K is from them and get a real valued period. Um, I shouldn't expect there to only be one, right? Things with, uh, with period two pi are also periodic with period four pi and also periodic with period eight pi. So generally these problems will have a degeneracy. 
if I, just depending on how many periods of the periodic solution I choose to look at. Um, and generally, they're going to have eigenfunctions and eigenvalues that don't correspond to a transverse uh, bifurcation from these planar waves, like the, the circumstances where k would be complex valued, for example. Uh, but you can do this to a fairly large class or to some equations at least. So here's KP, an example of a dimension breaking bifurcation from something that looks like a solitary wave and then fairly large computations uh, with lots of transverse variation that have bifurcated from that. Uh, in KP, we had the exact solution to use an initial guess. Uh, in most weakly nonlinear models, things like KP or this is a model that I named after myself. Uh, it's a very humble thing to do. Uh, the akers malevsky equation, uh, just had, it's similar in spirit to something like KP, except it has a bunch of Hilbert transforms in it. So some pseudo differential operator uh, just in the, in the X coordinate. Uh, so when you apply the same type of linearization to KP uh, that, you, that we did on the previous slide to KP to the akers malevsky equation, you also get something that morally speaking is an eigenvalue problem. And you can still compute all the eigenfunctions and all eigenvalues with something like a call to eig in MATLAB or your fa favorite eigen solver enough to use i. Uh, and that's a thing you could do at any point along a bifurcation branch and find out if bifurcations existed just by checking to see if you, the eigenvalues correspond to real periods. And once you found a real period, you could try and bifurcate from it, right? So these two models, KP and akers uh, they don't have the property advertised in their solutions uh, for traveling waves. These are not overturned traveling waves. These are functions of X1 and X2. Right? These are certainly functions of the horizontal coordinates. Uh, and one can't have overturned solutions to KP or akers malevsky because they have X and Y derivatives in them. Right? Your, the equations I want to find overturned traveling waves in must have, must be written as a parameterized interface. If I write it as a function of X and Y, I can't find a solution that's not a function of X and Y. So maybe not that deep a statement. So if you try and do this to uh, equations that you can write uh, as parameterized interfaces, so like the water wave equations, you can write the interface between water and air as a parameterized interface. Uh, well, the most interesting equations where you can do that, like water waves, uh, they don't just have two y derivatives in them, like we saw in this in the previous two models. Right? When I when I plugged in my linearization into this term that had the transverse variation with the two y derivatives, I just got a multiplier that was like the period squared that I had to solve for. If I try and do that same thing to something like the equations for deep water waves, well, the equations for deep water waves, the linear operator isn't just two y derivatives, it's some pseudo differential operator applied to the, to the interface location. Uh, that pseudo differential operator is typically defined in Fourier space, so it has some Fourier symbol like this. If I take the Fourier transform of the linear operator, I get the the wave number in x and y squared and then take a square root this is not it's not just k squared k2 squared it's the square root of k1 squared plus k2 squared some nonlinear function of the wave numbers in x and y applied to the Fourier transform of the solution that has serious consequences when it comes to trying trying to compute dimension breaking bifurcations and the consequences are when i plug in this linearization when i plug in I want to understand the action of this linear operator on U1 of alpha and cosine of some period times beta. It was called K on the previous slide. My apologies, it's now called D. Uh, when I compute the action on that, what I need to have is a new operator applied to U1 uh, times cosine of D. So that I, and you'll notice in the, in the problem I was trying to solve uh, here for, for KP, the linearization these are this is a function of x only at this stage after we've searched for what the governing equations are for u1 and k i get a function only of x so like in one dimension lower is where this eigenvalue problem lives uh when i do that here in the water wave problem i'll get something in one dimension lower uh but the action of this operator uh includes d in a nonlinear way right it used to be D square D just multiplied U1. So it was, it was as nonlinear as an eigenvalue problem before. Now, in some sense, it's more nonlinear than an eigenvalue problem. Instead of having D times my, like an eigenvalue times my eigenfunction, I have the eigenvalue like nested underneath the square root, which is itself in Fourier space. So it's like nested within the square root, which is within a differential operator. 
Uh, so the result is fun. That doesn't mean I can't solve it. It just means I don't get to apply to the structure of eigenvalue problems in order to solve it. The linearization is no longer an eigenvalue problem. It's just some general nonlinear pseudo differential equation I'm trying to solve that just the advantage of that equation isn't that it's simpler than the full equations. It's that it lives in one dimension lower. So it's not as costly to solve as say the full three dimensional equations I'm trying to solve. And that means that if I want to compute uh, large three dimensional overturned traveling waves with this solution procedure, what I have to do is I have to amend my continuation procedure that I discussed earlier. What do I have to do? First, I compute a branch of planar waves, right? Then uh, as I'm computing those waves, I have to compute the bifurcation data from each of those waves. Or I, ideally, I'd like to only compute the bifurcation data down at the three dimensional branch I'm trying to calculate. But I don't get to appeal to I. I don't get to solve an eigenvalue problem down here. I have to solve some general nonlinear problem, which means I have to use something like Newton's method instead of your favorite eigen solver to find the eigenvalue or the this this thing that's like the eigenvalue and eigenfunction down here at the at the place where my wave bifurcates that nonlinear problem if i'm using newton's method i need an initial guess where am i getting an initial guess maybe from a previous solution at a lower amplitude certainly not just out of the blue i don't have intuition for what these eigenfunctions should look like if we went back to like the KD, K, kdv kp example Right, the initial wave was set squared. So I might have said, oh, maybe it's gonna be something like set squared, but it was actually set cubed and set, right? So it's not true, it's not true that like the thing should just be some multiple of set. And it's not true that it's just like the derivative of u that I should be guessing here. Uh, so it because it's not trivial to guess what the initial guess ought to be for my nonlinear eigenvalue problem solver, uh, the the procedure is now to do continuation like somehow both in the waves and in the bifurcation data. So that's why there's two black curves here. I have to compute the two dimensional solutions and the bifurcation data for each of those solutions. Now, all the way up to the, the amplitude at which I wanna bifurcate into 3D. Um, so that's that's a procedure that, that on paper sounds wonderful because it costs me the two dimensional cost to move all the way up to large amplitude. However, uh, since I'm not using an eigen solver, I need I need to compute the bifurcation data with a Newton solver, which means I need an initial guess for that Newton solver. So that, that's what it says down here at the bottom. I need now I need both initial guesses for the for the waves I'm computing, which I might get from some asymptotics, but I also need them for the bifurcation data, which means I need some way of getting asymptotics for bifurcation data. And while for traveling waves, Stokes' method is very well known. For dimension breaking, the asymptotics is less well known. Uh, there have been people doing this. So uh, Frederick Diaz and Mariana Hargis uh, in 2000 wrote a paper where they uh, discussed the existence of dimension breaking bifurcations. Uh, later, Mariana with Mark Groves uh, and Sun in 2002 proved that uh, dimension breaking happens in the gravity capillary, gravity capillary problem uh, using a dimension breaking approach. Uh, and then uh, later, uh, Paul Malevsky and Zan Wang uh, used this idea numerically uh, to, to use some dimension breaking asymptotics to compute, uh, not overturning, but still uh, the dimension breaking bifurcation from planar to fully three dimensional uh, solutions. So, uh, so here's an example. When, when, when choosing your dimension breaking asymptotics, you certainly choose them based on the waves you're trying to compute. Um, if you're interested in periodic, uh, waves, then the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is a natural way to, to approach this. Uh, it searches for uh, solutions to a model equation, uh, which have some envelope, uh, but then multiply a sinusoidal solution at small amplitude. Small amplitude is where we're going to begin this uh, continuation of bifurcation data, right? We both need the bifurcation data continued from small amplitude to large, and also the solution, the traveling waves continued from small amplitude to large. Uh, so, so non-air Schrodinger equation is a natural place to, to work, but it doesn't have, if you're, if the thing you're searching for are not periodic waves or not wave packets, you might use some other asymptotic uh, onsets for the, to get yourself initial guesses. So in, uh, in, in Harrigus and Diaz, uh, and also Groves, Harrigus and Sun, uh, they they use KP. In fact, I think Harrigus and Diaz uses NLS and, and Harrigus and Sun uses KP. So it's not the only equation out there that can give you some asymptotics uh, to use for initial guesses. So then what do you do? You take this asymptotic onsets and you plug it into your model equation 
uh, and that gives you some other model equation that is hopefully simpler. So the derivation of, of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is systematic. If you say, I take whatever equation I want and substitute this in, uh, you get as a solvability equation for this ansatz that the envelope A has to satisfy the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And it comes, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation you get, I've, I've listed it here with all coefficients of one and all positive signs on those coefficients. That's not the way it comes. It comes with some signs and, and values for the coefficients that are inherited from the model equation. So somehow the model equation informs on whether there's a plus one here, here, and here, or whether there's arbitrary numbers and signs. After you have that model equation, you can try and do dimension breaking in the model equation and plug in an ansatz for this dimension breaking ansatz. Here's, this is what the, the periodic uh, solution to NLS or, or a solution to NLS that corresponds to a periodic solution of the original model equation where the spatial amplitude of this periodic wave is constant. Right, so there's no spatial dependence on this uh, solution I picked. And then I'll say, okay, so there was no spatial dependence here, but there's still a sinusoid. So this is saying, if you take a near linear solution and try and do dimension breaking nearby, uh, what do the eigenfunctions look like and what are the periods? So you substitute that in just like before, you get a bifurcation equation, but instead of it being pseudo differential, it's, well, I mean, it, it, it started with something that was completely differential, it started something that was integrable. So the, the gain of using some intermediate equation like NLS is that instead of having to solve this complicated nonlinear, not even really an eigenvalue problem for the bifurcation data, instead you get to solve uh, well, something like this isn't, this isn't even infinite dimensional anymore. This is a, an ODE really, or almost an ODE for the bifurcation data. And uh, so this is what you get as a result. Uh, it's a much easier equation to solve. In fact, I can write down a solution exactly. I uh, pick constant in space, constant in x1 uh, uh, solutions to this equation and get b is one. So that's the eigenfunction is constant and get the period out. And like I said at the beginning, the period was the hard thing to reconstruct. So from this equation, you can solve for what the period is and then and what a guess for the eigenfunction is. And then you can use that uh, to begin your continuation routine uh, in the more complicated nonlinear problem and then march up in, in a lower dimensional cost to compute larger and larger traveling waves. Uh, a nice thing about NLS as a proxy for doing these computations, a nice thing about the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is that because these coefficients are inherited from the model equation, they tell you whether or not these bifurcations are gonna exist. So for example, if we had done this same calculation uh, that, I had, that I had just presented uh, and the equation had a negative sign here, like if the model, if the thing I plugged in this ansatz to had induced a negative sign in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Uh, and then I did this linearization, well, that sign would propagate. And then I'd have, well, what a, when I'm trying to solve for P, what I fundamentally did is I said B was one, so there's no term here. And then uh, in the previous signs, uh, I was gonna solve for P, but there's a, P, a minus P squared, a three A and a one. And I just moved the P squared to the other side and took the square root. Right, and that's allowed since there, this minus sign allowed gave me a positive thing on the right to take this or on the left to take the square root of. But when a but when the NLS had the opposite sign, it like changed from elliptic to hyperbolic or something like that. Uh, then I can no longer take the square root. It it predicts uh, imaginary periods for the bifurcation data. So according to NLS, for small amplitude in a model equation with a negative sign here, there wouldn't be. Uh, periodic transverse bifurcations from small amplitude waves in whatever model had this sign. And so what that means is not only can you use it to get initial guesses, you can get you can use it to make predictions uh, on the existence of these transverse bifurcations uh, based on the coefficients that come from your own model. Uh, that's wonderful as a tool. Uh, I guess a little bit unfortunate, it is a big pain to compute these coefficients in, in any kind of sufficiently complicated model that, that you would be doing this in. So like for water waves, it's not like a 15 minute exercise to figure out what the coefficients are of NLS that correspond to water waves. Uh, it's more like a day, but it can be done. And then once you have them, uh, you can find out what the predictions it makes and then apply a dimension making, breaking bifurcation procedure. Whew. All right, uh, that's everything I have to say. I'm not gonna show you lots of computations of these things. Uh, it's not really the point of today's talk. Uh, here I do have a bunch of references, both of mine and of the ones I, I mentioned the most prominently in the talk. Uh, so like, I really like this paper by Groves, Harrigus, and Son uh, for understanding how this works in the analysis perspective. And then uh, Malevsky and Wang 
uh, they did this dimension, numerical dimension breaking bifurcations using NLS as a tool to find the gravity capillary solitary waves with transverse variation. Uh, both of those are great places to start if you want to learn about this uh, material. And then uh, I had a recent PhD student graduate uh, who has a, uh, a book chapter with me uh, where you can see the three-dimensional overturned uh, application of this procedure. All right, that's everything I have to say. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. I'll try and make eye contact. Oh, well, now your screen is frozen, so your eye contact is then is on. I'm not quite sure what happened. I, I do have a question, though. Um, so on the previous slide, uh, you said that so for NLS with the minus sign, you know, when you choose B equals one, it looks like you can't have these, uh, you can't have a validation branch. But there are other eigenfunctions. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. So uh, what I've what I've really said is there isn't an eigenfunction uh, with B equals one that has transverse variation or that has a transverse bifurcation. But there could absolutely be other ones, right? And NLS has a ton, right? And they're pretty well studied. So you could even like that's a, maybe another advantage of NLS as a as a proxy is that I mean one doesn't only have to search for the bifurcations that I look for. Okay. Uh, okay. I also have a question, uh, unless mm -hmm. Jeremy, you're, yeah, I'm done. Go. you're good. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so when you're computing these bifurcation diagrams, either for the, the planar case or after you've done the uh, dimension breaking and are looking at the bifurcation curves for the, the three-dimensional picture, um, have you ever run into problems where these bifurcation curves have turning points and you have to somehow change the way you're parameterizing the bifurcation curves? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. So that, that's, that's so in particular when you're looking for large amplitude, that happens quite a lot. Uh, and the, the the so there's multiple tactics that people use. So one is uh, what's called pseudo arc length continuation. Okay, that's what I was going to ask about. Is that what right. you use? Yeah. So I mean, I have used that. Uh, I've also just so uh, you, pseudo arc length continuation is nice because you don't have to think about it. Uh, it's a little bit more work to program than just saying I'll fix a Fourier mode. So sure. it just depends on like how lazy you're feeling that day. Like I've had experience that you can fix a Fourier mode of, mode of solution and, and march those until you've reached a turning point and then just switch to the next one and you often be able to navigate that turning point. Yeah, that's kind of what I do in my thesis right now. I'm very lazy, but I've, I've been learning about the pseudo arc length method. So I was just curious if that's something that you've implemented yourself. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Uh, there's a there's a recent uh, PhD of uh, Matt Johnson's at Kansas. Uh, his, this guy's name is Kyle Clausen. He's now at Rose Holman. Uh, so he wrote a bunch of stuff about using pseudo arc length for, for bidirectional widom. Uh, and his presentation is really clean about it if you want to read and like try and understand it to add into your thesis. Yeah, it's excellent. I, uh, I already have him cited. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great paper. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, hello, Dr. Eckers. Hello, Dr. Eckers. Oh, I think uh, yeah. My name is uh, George Chow from University of Texas, uh, UTRGB. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, very good talk. I'm interested in the traveling wave solution in three-dimensional space. Yeah. Uh, look at the KP setting. Uh, can you go back to maybe the first few slides showing the KP equation? Yeah. Yeah, I saw the, the right, right, right. Uh, right, yes. Look at left hand side. Mm -hmm. I remember there's a key term. There's a, where's the key term? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so in, in my slides, I've already moved to the traveling reference frame. Uh, so uh -huh. that oh, you the, already the, first the time remove the now like C times U. Oh, I right. see. Okay. C, okay. C times UX, right? But then I factor out the X derivative, right? So this okay. is okay. 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 I got you. Okay. You great. The time dependent KDV and shifted it to a traveling frame and then threw away the time derivative. Then that's how you get this. Oh, okay. Okay. So, okay. Good. Uh, so the, when you do the 3D case, uh, I saw the in third variable Z is related to T. But second one doesn't depend on time t. You go over 
Um, so I'm not sure I'd presented the evolution equations in 3D. I think maybe you're talking about this slide. Uh, uh, the very few last one, I think. Uh, they just the 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 one shooting nonlinear shooting equation. That one. I saw uh, you use the that that place. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, let me. See. Yes, here. So look at uh, the. You have the x of what minus one uh, minus c t. The yes. x does those are fine. But third one, you put epsilon square t. Yep. Right. Yep. So why is the third one? Why not the second one? Well, uh, so, are... so um, so x three is the position, right? And then okay. in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, there's a classic scaling that the spatial uh -huh. variables get uh -huh. scaled by the wave amplitude. Right. And the time variable gets scaled by the amplitude squared. Uh, that the reason that the time variable gets scaled by the amplitude squared uh, yeah, right. is because uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, the solvability condition that gives you this, is due to a quartet resonant interaction between uh, the wave, the original harmonic, and itself that happens in epsilon squared. So if you want to get this equation, the, the NLS equation, oh, you have to have to the the of epsilon squared to get this time. And then the fact that there's a quartet gives you this thing that has like three copies of A in it. Uh, if that, okay, okay. if you're interested in the circumstance where time scales like epsilon, uh, then mm -hmm. there needs to be a triad interaction, which doesn't happen for typical wave numbers. Uh, I see. So if you want a, a couple of good references for like this derivation, uh, there's a book by Johnson. It's called. Uh, Brief introduction to the mathematical theory of water waves, uh, where he does all these derivations. Oh, yeah, I know R.J. Johnson. Yeah, yeah, I know him. Yeah. That's a pretty good I book. Uh, mm -hmm. He doesn't talk so much about the quartet and triads, uh, but uh, definitely the the why the scaling is what it is is, is presented pretty well there. Okay, I see. So any uh, high order term as long as the power greater than two, you uh, skip that. You just keep yeah, the. Right. That's right. So this, I mean, I've written the ansatz as this is what the leading order thing is. And then there's mm -hmm. epsilon squared. You actually have to go to epsilon cubed in this value. Yes, epsilon right. With this equation. Oh, I see. Okay, 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 okay. Makes sense. Oh, oh maybe a last uh, question. So, you know, in that way, do you have uh, the examples for two dimensional or even high dimensional Kamasa home equation? We have the peak the solid for waves. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't done that. Uh, it, you know, is there a does does Kamasa home have a formulation that allows for overturned? Yes, correct. So that that's what I don't know. Like, is it written as a function of x only, or is it written as a function of arbitrary coordinate? That's both the x and the t, definitely. Yeah. But if yeah. you want to compute, so you could you could do dimension breaking. On a on a Kamasa home to higher dimensional Kamasa home, and my impression is it would be similar to this, uh, but I don't okay. know that you could compute overturned solutions in Kamasa okay. home because I think it's written as a function of x, so the solutions okay. can't be not functions of x. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Interesting though. Thank you. Appreciate your questions. Sure. No problem. So uh, I have another question. Uh, so when you consider one dimensional surface over two dimensional uh, fluid and you're working with the Bernoulli equation, then you can use the conformal variables to write down the shed noise. Yep. So what do you do for a uh, overturned wave in when you actually have a second dimension on the surface? So is that yeah, so I I don't try and extend conformal mappings. In fact, I don't use conformal mappings at all. So you, if you want, so I, I never wrote I never wrote the equations on these slides. Uh, so I guess I'm kind of being lazy, uh, but uh, the formulation uh, is in some something. Yeah, so you can read about it in uh, this paper, Akers, Ambrose, and Wright. Uh, there's a, another formulation of the waterway problem called the vortex sheet formulation, which is basically like takes a boundary integral approach or like a Green's function approach uh, to deal with the other with the fluid domain apart from the interface. And uh, you can apply Green's functions or boundary integrals on arbitrary boundaries. Uh, and so you get, some, you get it costs you something. The reason that people haven't been using this forever is because then there's a burkhoff rot integral that you have to evaluate, which is more expensive than what in conformal mappings, you just still have a differential equation at the end. Uh, you don't have some non-local integral, uh, non-linear convolution that you have to evaluate, which is both expensive and singular. So like the, the 
the cost of, of this form of the vortex sheet formulation to implement is more expensive than conformal mappings. However, it, it can be extended to however many dimensions you want. I mean, I guess we live in three dimensions, so we're probably not extending it to five, but you, it, it extends naturally to the next dimension. Uh, that, that cost, however, is a lot more, and that's kind of the whole motivation for this work, is that if the if three-dimensional problem, it's not hard to write, but it's hard to solve, then you're not willing to solve it every step along the branch. You're willing to solve the two-dimensional problem, which you could choose whatever formulation you want of the two-dimensional problem. So you could use conformal mappings to find this blue curve, but then you need a whole other formulation to find the red curve. When I want to step off here, these steps are really expensive. So that's why I, why one would use an approach like this, so that I compute the two-dimensional thing up to large amplitude, and then I step off at large amplitude when I'm computing the three-dimensional thing. The, the motive, like our hope when doing this was always that I would just directly apply this to Crapper, right? Where I have the solutions, right? There's a formula for the solutions for all amplitude. And then I would say, well, what about this guy here where there's a bubble? What's the three-dimensional thing look like near that bubble? So we've never done that. We haven't, haven't been able to get it to work. Uh, and the, the reason, morally speaking, is that uh, this problem is hard still. Like not just, to, it's, it's both hard to solve and it's hard to write. Right? The linearization through this singular integral kernel is a non-trivial exercise. Uh, and so that, that's a thing that my uh, former PhD student, uh, Matt Siders, is still working on. Uh, so hopefully we'll get that done and we'll, uh, someday you'll be able to see pictures of what do overturn traveling waves near Crapper look like, but I don't know the answer today. I hope that answers your question. I kind of cut you off. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you for speaking one more time. All right, thank you. Appreciate the invitation. Give my best to Bernard. What's that? Give my best to Bernard. Okay, well, Dave, thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're making that.